December 8th, 2001. I didn't want to go to goddamn Vermont. It's a bad state, plain and simple. Too much maple syrup. If it were my choice, I wouldn't have gone. But it wasn't my choice. It was that stuck-up, condescending shrink, Suzanne Adams' idea. She told me if I didn't go on this retreat, I'd never be reinstated, plain and simple. I glared at Suzanne as she sat in the passenger seat. That smug look she always wore plastered across her milky white face. Eyes on the road, Pat, she said, her tone light and airy, but I knew she was mocking me. My friends call me Pat, I grumbled, reluctantly looking back to the tail lights of the next car in our convoy. You can call me Patrick. There was eight cars in this procession, each containing a shrink and either a cop or soldier that said shrink had deemed mentally unfit to continue active duty. I was the former. After a plane crashed into the World Trade Center on September 11th, I was among the first to respond. So my partner, along with six other officers I knew personally, guys I had befriended during my time there, I was the only one I knew that made it out alive. Sure, it got me down. But the way to get me out of it sure wasn't talking about my feelings with Suzanne Adams. I just wanted to get back to work, and this was the way to do it. In case you couldn't tell, I'm not big on talking about feelings. Sure, it's a cliche, the grizzly guarded cop, but I think I've earned the right to be a cliche. How much longer is the drive, I grumbled. She checked her hand watch, a little under an hour. I rolled my eyes but didn't respond for a while. However, something eventually prompted me to. When the first small flakes of snow fell from the heavens, I ignored them. I figured it was just nature taunting me. That they'd be gone before anything accumulated. Then five minutes passed. The snowfall grew heavier and a white dusting appeared on the road. I was getting annoyed, and I was about to snap at Suzanne when I saw that she seemed to worry about it. I thought you said that the weather was clear, I muttered. That's what every station I checked said, she replied nervously. We wouldn't have to come if it was going to snow. It gets dangerous up here. No shit, I said. Don't the roads get closed if it snows enough? She winced as she looked at me. Yes, I sighed. Come on, it's not that bad. If it got to the point where we wouldn't be able to turn back, someone ahead of us would have pulled over by now, she said, trying to recover. I reluctantly resolved myself to waiting until her point could be disproven. As we drove on, however, the snow thickened. It was quickly becoming a borderline blizzard with flakes as big as my thumb being whipped at the windshield, the wipers frantically scrubbing back and forth to keep visibility up. However, it eventually became impractical, as the snow piled up to block my view became less of a problem than the sheer density of the flakes coming down. It was like a blanket, an impenetrable wall of white. I was driving blind, so I slowly rolled the car to a halt and looked over to Suzanne, who wore a look that was a combination of nervousness and apology. All right, Suzanne, where do we go now, I asked, as insultingly as I can muster. Patrick, I'm sorry, I had no idea this was going to happen, she said, her tone almost pleading. Listen, why don't we just give one of the others a call? They'll tell us where we are. Reception's going to be a pipe dream up here, I muttered. But she tried anyway. Of course she did. She was that kind of blind optimist. She pressed the tip of her phone to her forehead, biting her lip as it rang. It barely emanated two rings before cutting out. All right, now what, I asked. Let's keep driving, Suzanne said. I think that's what you're supposed to do when you're lost, right? If you double back, it decreases your chance of being found. That doesn't make any sense, I replied, but I really had no experience to base the claim off of. Just do it, it's better than just sitting here, she quickly told me. I shrugged, her logic seemed sound. 
I turned on the high beams and leaned forward, driving at a crawl as I tried to remain on the road. It was a painstakingly slow process, inching forward through the dense snow, and though the small clock on the dashboard told me it had only been about ten minutes since the snow had started, I was convinced it had been much more. By some miracle, the snow lessened for a few minutes, and I was able to see the road. I couldn't recognize a thing, and when I turned to Suzanne, she had a similar look of confusion. Where are we? I asked. This isn't anywhere on the way to the retreat. I've driven the route dozens of times, she told me, with a look of worry that far exceeded what I believed our situation to be. So, at least we're on a paved road. It's not like we're stuck in the middle of the forest, I replied. We can just turn back. We'll eventually get back to the road. No, you don't understand, she said. There are no wrong turns to make. It's a straight shot through to the retreat. Then where the hell are we, I asked. There's no way she trailed off for a moment. Do you think we could have overshot it? Not a chance, I shook my head. It's only been 40 minutes, and for 10 of those, we've been going half a mile an hour. We're barely halfway there by my guess. That's impossible, Suzanne replied. I've never seen this road in my life. Maybe it's just the snow. It tends to make things, you know, lighter. I pointed out, but she wasn't amused. Come on, Patrick, seriously, she said, exasperated. I know what I'm talking about. It must be some sort of private property, I guess. It's the only option. But still, I don't understand how it could have gone up in between now and the last time I was here. Well, if it's developed, that means there's people there. If there's people there, we can find out where we are. I don't like that idea. We don't know what's in there, Suzanne argued. It could be a government facility, or it could be a house full of crazy people. I mean, they'd be living a secluded life up here. What if they're cannibals? They can't be much crazier than spending the night in the car, I replied. We're a quarter tank. There's no way we'd make it through the night. Really, she asked. Do you think we could survive without the heat? I sighed. All right, let's say we somehow managed to survive the temperatures that will most likely drop, well, below zero tonight. What happens when we wake up to find the car buried in six feet of snow? I'm guessing AAA doesn't cover this area. What then? She pursed her lips, thinking about it for a moment. All right, I guess, I guess that's the best idea, she relented. I nodded and put the car into gear, resuming our drive. We didn't speak until we reached the lights. At first, they appeared as pinpricks in the distance, and I ignored them on the chance that they were figments of my imagination. But as we got closer, they grew in size, and it became clear that they were real. What wasn't yet clear was what they were, but that would soon become apparent. The snow suddenly cleared out, and after a few swipes of the windshield wipers, we could see why. We've driven under a protruding roof that jutted out from what seemed to be a large house, and directly in front of us was a wide window revealing a ballroom, along with its occupants. What must have been nearly 50 people were inside, some dancing, some simply mingling about, but all of them were wearing lavish intricate masks covering their faces. They were all dressed up to a black tie standard, and none of them seemed to notice our car. I exchanged a glance with Suzanne and saw that she was equally unnerved. I'm sure you can imagine how off-putting it felt to come across a lavish mansion in the middle of the woods, in the middle of the mountains, and to see a masquerade ball taking place. They were creepy enough on their own. In this setting, they were downright terrifying. But I knew that the fear was childish and impractical. This place might be the only civilization for miles. We couldn't afford to go back on the road. We needed this place. Come on, let's do this, I said, putting the car into park. I got out then waited for Suzanne to join me. She did so extremely reluctantly. 
We didn't speak on the way up to the front door, which was quite the walk. We passed through a dying garden, one that likely hadn't been expected to last through the winter, then a long stretch of house, at which point we saw the large stairs that led up to the entrance. The roof of the house protruded out several feet, not quite as far as it had over the window of the ballroom, but enough to provide cover for the sheets of snow coming down. When we reached the door itself, I lifted the heavy knocker and then let it bang down several times. Then I stepped back and waited. After a moment, the door swung open to reveal a man. He was tall, but scrawny. In fact, that would have escaped all but the most attentive eyes. As his expensive suit distracted from his frame, he gave me a long look, then nodded, and after a moment said, We've been expecting you, Frank. I raised an eyebrow and said, We're not expected, and my name's not Frank. No, but can you imagine if it was, he asked, and burst into laughter, completely shattering the character I'd pinned him for. Ah, I cracked myself up. My name's Mustashi Sagawara. I live here. Please, come in. I was too put off by the sudden and drastic change in his personality to question the invitation, so I followed him into the house. Suzanne was not far behind. So, what are you two doing way out here in the wilderness, he asked, leading us down a hallway in the direction of the odd ballroom we'd seen earlier. You are a couple of star-crossed honeymooners who didn't plan for snow? Ha, I scoffed, shaking my head, but didn't elaborate. Suzanne rolled her eyes and answered for me. I'm Suzanne, this is Patrick, and I'm actually his therapist, she said. We're supposed to go on a retreat, but then this snow came out of nowhere. Well, if that isn't the most unfortunate thing I've heard tonight, Mustachi replied, turning to face us as we reached the end of the hallway. Well, anything you need, I'd be happy to provide. Do you think you'll be staying the night? At that, I furrowed my brow, but Suzanne quickly replied that I'd be wonderful, Mr. Segawara. I'll have the servants prepare two guest rooms, he nodded, signaling for a hand to attend to him. A command that was obeyed nearly instantaneously. I watched the servant that responded closely, and I could see through his fast jerky movements and an almost scared look in his eyes that he didn't want to be here, that he was scared of Matoshi. He took his orders, then ran off, disappearing down a side hallway. I decided not to say anything, but remained on high alert. There was a party going on inside, Suzanne began, and I winced internally. What's that all about? It seemed like a masquerade ball. Do you throw them often? He cocked his head. A masquerade ball? I'm not familiar. You know, everyone wears masks. You hide your identity, she asked. You're telling me you have masquerade balls going on in your house that you don't even know about. I should hope not, he said, a confused smile coming to his face. I'm afraid I'm not sure what you're talking about. Suzanne pointed in the direction we'd seen the ball. That's funny. I could have sworn I saw one. Right, Patrick? I didn't see anything. Still sizing up. Matoshi. Well, what's in that room then? Suzanne asked. It actually is a ballroom. Unfortunately, it's unfinished, and it is yet to be used, Matoshi replied, walking over to the double doors. See? He asked, opening both of them, and sure enough, the room was empty. Not only were the masked dancers missing, but the room was completely unfurnished, without the piano I remembered from the corner, or the chandelier hanging from the ceiling, amongst other things. That's strange, Suzanne remarked, but seemed able to shrug it off. Matoshi closed the door, then turned back to us. Moving on from the incident, well, how would you two like some dinner? I hardly ever get company up here. I glanced at Suzanne, but she already nodded at him. We'd love to. We haven't eaten in hours. Excellent. I'll have the kitchen prepare two extra meals, he said with a 
sickly, sweet smile on his face. I'd better go check on the car, I said quickly, thinking up an excuse. I noticed that Matayoshi's eyes lingered on me for just a moment too long before he replied, Sure thing, Patrick. Something about this wasn't right, that's for sure. But if I could just make sure I'd seen that masquerade ball, that would at least give me some confidence. It wouldn't give me an answer, and it certainly wouldn't make anything easier, but at least I'd know that I saw what I thought I saw. I walked with them until the entrance, then I went down the steps through the garden and finally out to the area beneath the overhang where the snow-covered car sat. But there was no ball. The warm, glowing light that had drawn me to this place to begin with was gone, leaving the area dark and unwelcoming. It had been replaced with an untextured wall, the same color as the rest of the exterior. Certainly not a job that could have been performed in the time between the last time I saw the ball and now. I approached the wall and was reaching out my hand to touch it when suddenly a voice from behind me cleared its throat and I jumped. Then in a gruff voice it said, you're not supposed to be here. Hey guys, thank you for listening to today's Creepy Pasta, and I hope you enjoyed. I do have a podcast called The Murder House Radio Show. Check it out, the link will be in the description below. It is a true crime podcast. But if you did like, like, comment, subscribe, and share for more, hit the bell notification when you subscribe, and select all to get all notifications whenever I upload. I upload six days a week, Monday to Saturday, at least one video a day. Now all the long episodes and full series of creepypastas are on all major podcasting platforms under the name Deadly underscore Zone underscore Narrations. There will be a link in the description. Also, go follow all the social medias, they are in the description below. I do have a subreddit called Deadly Narrations, the link will be in the description. Also in the description below are the sources to the creepypasta and the music used, so go check those out. Let me know what creepypasta you would like to hear next, or if you have your own you would like me to narrate, or if you have a creepypasta series you would like to hear, send them to me on any of the social medias in the DMs, or to my email address which is also in the description or leave them in the comments below. Also in the description below is the author's social medias if they have any listed. But that's it for today's creepy pasta. I hope you enjoyed. Until next time in the Deadly Zone, stay deadly and stay spooky.